The long-awaited Hinman emails have finally been released in the Ripple vs. SEC lawsuit, proving that the former chairman was pushed by officials to clarify that Ether was not a security before they began to attack the rest of the altcoin market. Quant is an exhibitor in the Euro Banking Association alongside major players like the European Central Bank, JP Morgan, HSBC Swift, and Nexi Group. Polygon 2.0 has been announced, which is said to bring major upgrades to the protocol as well as the tokenomics formatic. And Crowcoin has just hit a new yearly low after the Binance lawsuit continues, and the BNB token has also taken a massive beating. We are going to break down all of this for you guys and more in today's day market update so to start off with the biggest piece of news and that would be the Hinman emails that were finally released these were long awaited in the ripple lawsuit a lot of people believe that this would be the smoking gun for ripple to win their case and unfortunately while I don't think that is going to be the case there was a lot of interesting stuff here that does show a massive conflict of interest between William Hinman the SEC and Bitcoin ether and the rest of the altcoin market as a whole so for starters the Hitman emails include exchanges between the former chairman and members of the SEC staff in preparation for a June 2018 speech, which basically discussed how digital assets might be regulated. Now, in this speech, William Hinman did deem that both Bitcoin and Ethereum were in fact not securities, and this has been a massive point of contention for Ripple because they are basically making the point of how can Ethereum not be considered a security but XRP can. So here is in fact a uh, a little excerpt from the emails and we can see here that he was in fact being pressured to call ether a commodity and not a security in the speech he said putting aside the fundraising that accompanied the creation of ether based on my understanding of the present state of ether the ethereum network and its decentralized structure current offers and sales of ether are not securities transactions in an email hinman said that the language around ether quote would be used if we all are in agreement we also have a call with vitalik later this week to confirm our understanding of how the ethereum foundation operates now we also saw here that Google document comments show an unnamed editor basically going ahead and suggesting that they do not want to call Bitcoin a security. An additional comment left on the document says, we thought you were going to say that you don't believe ETH is a security. We think that is a helpful message. This statement on the other hand appears to likely to create more confusion about the status of ETH. A couple of different things coming out of the emails there. The first one being that Hinman did directly state that besides the initial fundraising or ICO for Ether that it should not be deemed a security. However, we know that one of the big foundations of the Ripple vs. SEC lawsuit is the fact that Ripple sold XRP to fundraise. So why is the Ethereum ICO being ignored and pardoned, but XRP, the XRP ICO is not? We also know that Hinman and other people from the SEC were potentially having backdoor conversations with Vitalik before the speech. And last but not least, I think this is the biggest piece here is the regulatory gap. So basically what they're saying is that in other words this speech acknowledges there are, there is no other category it's not a security because there is no controlling group at least in the how we sense yet like many other things there may need there may be need for regulation to protect purchases and this is proof of the regulatory gap that securities laws are incomplete when it comes to digital assets that securities law are not meant to rule over all digital assets and that many digital assets are not in fact securities so a very interesting point being made here, the Howey test, which was made in the 1960s, cannot apply to a 21st century technology with so many complex use cases. And this is a massive proof of the regulatory gap that we have been talking about here on the channel. So I do believe that this is a big piece that could in fact help XRP be deemed a non-security and something that could help make the push forward for more appropriate legislation and regulation to come to crypto. Now, regardless of what is happening here in the US with Ripple and XRP, they are still continuing to dominate on a global scale and also within the US. So we see here that a couple of weeks back, Ripple acquired Medico for $250 million. Medico is a cryptocurrency custody company based in Switzerland. And with this move, Ripple has now expanded its offerings and will be able to custody, issue, and settle any type of tokenized asset. Now, interestingly enough, if we go back to 2022, we can see here that 
Citigroup actually partnered with Medico to develop institutional digital asset custody capabilities. This collaboration brings together Medico's technology and digital solutions with Citi's expansive custody network to develop a platform to enable clients to store and settle digital assets seamlessly and securely. Citi intends to fully integrate Medico's bank-grade digital asset custody and orchestration platform Harmonize into its existing infrastructure to develop and pilot digital asset custody capabilities. So now that Medico has been acquired by Ripple, there is in fact a direct link between Ripple and Citigroup, one of the largest banks in America. And this goes to show that despite what is happening with the SEC, that Ripple does continue to make very strong connections with major banks in America, but also on a global scale. We also saw here recently that Ripple joined Hong Kong's CBDC pilot, partnering up with Fubon Bank, and the pilot program is looking how to basically tokenize assets beyond just a central bank digital currency, also looking to offer solutions for real estate asset tokenization and equity releases using the CBDC. We also actually saw yesterday that Ripple and the University of Toronto kind of collaborated here, as UFT is now going to start an XRP validator in their partnership with Ripple. So clearly Ripple is a big, big player here in cryptocurrency. XRP is still one of the largest cryptos by market cap. And I do believe that regardless of the outcome of the lawsuit, that Ripple will be a successful company. However, if they could operate in the US, if XRP could be deemed a non-security, I think this would lead to some very explosive price action for XRP. And that's why we are keeping a close eye on the lawsuit. We also see here HSBC, the largest European bank based in by total assets mentions the xrp ledger for cross-border payments so it says here on their website dlt can streamline end-to-end -end value transfers reducing cost operational risks and settlement periods for example ripple's xrp ledger provides real-time cross-border settlements using tokens that represent central bank currencies now, speaking of HSBC, we've noted some very interesting connections between HSBC and Quant. We know that HSBC did in fact tap into Oracle to accelerate the digitization of their bank. And if we actually take a look at Quant Network's partners here, we know that Quant is in fact partnered up with Oracle and helping them facilitate interoperability via the Oracle blockchain. So lots of, lots of interesting connections here between Quant and major banks in both the UK as well as Europe. We know that Quant is an existing in the Euro Banking Association alongside big, big names like Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, BNY Mellon, Citigroup, HSBC, MasterCard, Fidelity International Services, Swift, and Nexi Group. And I do think it's definitely worth noting here that Quant is also partnered up with Nexi, who just announced positive results in their CBDC pilot test with the European Central Bank. The test shows it is possible to integrate a digital euro with the existing European payment landscape, and guess who connects legacy infrastructure to distributive ledger technology? That would be Quant. So while we do not have a direct link between Quant and the European Central Bank, we know that the ECB and Nexi are working together. We know that Nexi is tapping into Quant's technology. The same way we know that Oracle is tapping into Quant's technology was partnered up with HSBC. And I do believe that in the next couple of years, a lot of these indirect partnerships will see some direct impact on the Quant token price itself as demand for overledger does also equate to demand for the quant utility token and on the topic of the quant utility token i do want to quickly speak about this altcoin as we have seen some very interesting price action over the past couple of days and i think it is back at a very strong area of support which has historically made for some very nice double digit return so taking a look at the charts we can see that quant is coming back up on a very key area of support at that hundred dollar range also worth noting here that we are now coming up on the June 2022 bottom that Quant put in in the bear market so far of last year. And from that June level, if you had held all the way up to that peak there in October at 228, you'd be looking at a gain of about 434%. 
However, assuming you held quant and have not sold a single token but still bought around that bottom level, you would still be up a very impressive 136%, which does in fact show that quant has been one of, if not the best performer in the top 100. Now, this $100 area we can see has been a big area, a big buying zone for quant historically. I'm not saying that means it will be again, but what I am saying is that prior history shows that $100 has given some very nice returns. So for example here, you can see the first time we actually crossed over 100 after the bear market lows in July of 2022, Quant rallied 30% from $100 up to 130. Then we broke above 100 back here again in September, rallying 125% from that level to $228. Then once again here in November, we saw it rally from 100 to 130, another 30% rally. And in the new year, a nice rally from $100 to 160, so a nice 60% rally. And just here as late as this was actually May, uh, late May, so not even a couple of weeks ago, Quant once again hit $100. We spoke about the breakout above the downtrending channel, and it did once again make a nice double digit move of about 19% up to $119. Now you can see here this kind of like upside down U, Quant basically reversed that entire move and is right back down at the strong area of support. So I'm not saying that it will hold this time. I'm not saying that we're going to see a guaranteed double digit return. What I am saying is that historically $100 has been a very good buying opportunity and therefore I am keeping my eye on quant to see how it does behave at this level. Now I do want to talk about Polygon here. This is another one of those projects that has been a very solid performer throughout the bear market and the Polygon team has continued to build. I think that's why the project has been so successful throughout the last year and they are now moving forward with Polygon 2.0. They say here, our vision for Polygon is simple, to build the value layer of the internet. The internet allows anyone to create and exchange information. The value layer allows anyone to create, exchange, and program value. Enter Polygon 2.0, a blueprint to build the ultimate value layer. Polygon 2.0 is a set of upgrades that radically reimagine almost every aspect of Polygon, from protocol architecture to tokenomics to governance. It is a roadmap for how Polygon will become the value layer offering unlimited scalability and unified liquidity via zero knowledge technology. In the coming weeks, we will detail every component of Polygon 2.0 in a series of post AMAs and more, including the future of Polygon and the proof of stake chain, utility and evolution of the native token, transition to greater community governance of the protocol and treasury. Polygon 2.0 is the culmination of over a year of collaboration between various ecosystem participants. Now it's time to, for the community to, to shine. Stay tuned, get familiar with Polygon 2.0 and join the conversation. So here is the official blog post here. And I'm not going to break down exactly what is happening in the blog post, but I am going to kind of talk about the big important dates that we do need to be keeping our eye on. So June 19th, they are going to be talking about the Polygon proof of stake blockchain. June 26th, architecture and stack. July 10th, the token, which I am most interested in, obviously, as that should have or rather could have some implication on the price action, depending on what is announced here. And July 17th is governance. So definitely keen on hearing more about Polygon 2.0 know and this team is very good in terms of the marketing building hype making some big web 2 partnerships and bringing them into web 3 and if they can continue i do believe that polygon 2.0 and the matic token itself will be a success now to wrap things up i do want to talk about crow coin here as we are now sitting at a new yearly low and unfortunately, I don't really think this has so much to do with Crowcoin. I think it is being caught up in a lot of the BNB and Binance nonsense. However, this does still have implications on the price action of Crowcoin. And clearly what's happening with Binance does also have implications on Crypto.com. As after the Binance US lawsuit was announced, Crypto.com did announce a couple of days later they would be exiting their US institutional business. So I do just want to give you guys kind of like an update on the Crowcoin price here because because I am in fact eyeing a low level of about two and a half cents for Crowcoin now. I know that people might not want to hear that. I know that if you are bullish on Crowcoin, the last thing you want to hear is that I could see another 50% haircut from this level. However, I'm not here to sugarcoat things or to pump bags or to tell you guys unrealistic expectations. I'm here to give you what I am honestly looking for from the crypto market. You don't have to agree with me, but this is simply my opinion. And zooming out here on a five-year chart, I want to show you two main things. So, 
I'm actually going to zoom in here to 2020. So we can see here that the first time Crow hit two and a half cents, it then actually went on a nice rally up to nine cents. So over a 3.5 X. And then we saw a nice double bottom at two and a half cents before it rallied all the way up to about 20 cents. So give or take like a, a 10, an eight to 10 X there from that two and a half cent level. And from there, it has not revisited that two and a half cent area since. Now, what I'm noticing is the five and a half cents, which did act as a nice trading range here on that on the capitulation in November, which we did cover on the channel, it looks like it is now at threat of being broken. We can see that Crowcoin got rejected at the bull market support band once and then twice here again and then a third time here again in April. And if we actually zoom out here and take a look on the longer time frames for Crowcoin, we can see that the bull market support band has historically been pretty accurate in depicting whether or not Crowcoin and the broader crypto market really has been either bullish or bearish. I mean, you can see here it got rejected in March of 2022, and then it got rejected again in November, once again in February, once again in April, all of which times Crowcoin has done nothing but continue to dump to new lows. Therefore, I will be looking for two and a half cents as my next level of support and this is where i may be interested once again in picking up some more crow coin so on that note i hope you did enjoy the content in today's video you know what to do if you made it all the way to the end you are an absolute champion let me know in the youtube comments down below and claim that champion status i hope you are all having an amazing day and i hope to catch you in the next one peace out for now